before we get on with the show, remember, you can listen to us literally anywhere. Podbean, iTunes, Spotify. You can find us on Twitter. We have our own Twitter account. MIA in the hunt. Not missing in the hunt. Miami in the hunt. Now let's get on with the show and get ready for some football. And welcome back to In The Hunt Podcast. It is officially week 11 of our show, but we are getting ready for the third week of preseason, arguably the biggest week of the year in preseason. And we are joined by Simon Clancy, who is a lead feature writer for Gridiron Magazine, contributed writer for Sports Illustrated, New York Times. He, you, you hear his voice on Three Yards Per Carry from the Five Reads Network. And Simon, I'm going to start you here. Why on earth are you a Dolphins fan? <laughs> um, so I will. Do you want the long version or the short version? <laughs> Give, we'll take the long. I I, I okay. need to hear the story. So I went to see Ghostbusters, the original <laughs> Ghostbusters with Dan Aykroyd, <laughs> at a birthday, a kid's birthday party when I was like I don't know nine, ten, or whatever. When we came back from Ghostbusters, we had like the birthday cake and that kind of thing at this at this kid's house, and somebody put the telly on and uh, the TV on, and there was. Uh, it used to be a program in the afternoon on a Saturday afternoon over here called World of Sport, which used mm. to have lots of soccer coverage and, and, and kind of other sort of niche European sports that you guys like darts and things. But then they kind of occasionally would show highlights of, uh, of this kind of weird game from the US, the, uh, the, from the NFL, which is this kind of weird, you know, weird. <laughs> and the very first thing I saw was, was Dan. So this was 1984. So the season after Marino was drafted and, uh, I just showed this kind of long-haired, fluffy-haired kid in a dolphin uniform throwing the ball deep down the field, which just looked sexy as hell to me. So <laughs> that was it. I was smitten at that point, and it's been uh, it's been that way ever since. And it's now uh, well, I'm now 44, so I was probably was about nine at the time. So yeah, it's been a while. What was more memorable, seeing Dan Marino throw for the first time, or going to see Ghostbusters? Because you kind you mentioned Ghostbusters first. So that it's a bit of a toss up, <laughs> frankly. I'm not really into I'm not really into sci fi type things. So Ghostbusters was fine. Marino was different gravy, different class. So with your Dolphin fandom, you've literally been through, I would say, the good, the bad, hell? and yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Good, bad, and hell. Like there's no ugly, it's just hell. There's, uh, not been, there's not been that much good either, let's be honest. I mean, you had Dan Marino, so I consider that good. Yeah, I mean, you know. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's like, the good part that's like dating scarlett johansson but not being allowed to sleep with her so, i like that that's a great metaphor i like that know? so we, we know what, what phase are we in what phase are, what phase are the dolphins currently in good bad or hell we're kind of do- dating roseanne Barr at the moment so that kind of... <laughs> jesus christ okay <laughs> i mean like listen I, I, i'm not as down on the team as uh, you know people that listen to to the to the three yards per carry will probably know i'm not as down as other people and maybe i'm a bit more of a glass half Full guy, um, but you know, I, I, I certainly do believe in Coach Gaze, and you know, it's a point I bang on about. If you take the last, you don't, you take his tenure here in Miami, he's 16 and 16 in the 32 regular season games, and he's only had his franchise quarterback for 11 of those games. You take Mike McCarthy, a Super Bowl winner at a better Green Bay team, he's 17 and 15 over the same period of time, and he's also had arguably the greatest quarterback of all time in Aaron Rodgers for 22 of those 32 games. So, you know, there's not a great deal of difference when you weigh it up and look at it uh, on those things. And people tend to knock that, you know, I saw somebody, I saw Rich Eisen tweet today about how the AFCs this year would essentially be two rookie quarterbacks, Tom Brady and uh, and Tanner, uh, you know, one Tom Brady, one Tanner, or, you know, he said two rookie quarterbacks, one 41-year-old and one Tanner. And then the comments <laughs> underneath were like people, you know, ripping Ryan, right. which is an easy thing, you know, an easy thing to do for people who, you know, mm-hmm. stopped watching the Dolphins four years ago. Sure. Um, uh, and a few people were kind of saying, you know, that year that, you know, the year that the Dolphins went to the playoffs two seasons ago, Tannehill didn't take them to the playoffs because he got injured. You know, totally forgetting the fact that we were eight and five, that he was playing the best football of his career. Right. Generally, the team was playing really well. And, you know, it, it's easy to, you can find many sticks to beat the Dolphins with. But, you know, it was the only reason we beat the Steelers. You know, we only beat one good team, and that was because Ajayi had 200 yards rushing. And, you know, it kind of gets boring, that narrative. You know, the kid's a good player. And, you know, he was he was playing the best football of his career at the time that he got hurt. So, 
and, and all arrows seem to be pointing in, a, in an upwards direction in terms of where he is currently. So, you know, if he stays healthy, I think he's a, you know, I think we might be at least dating somebody mildly attractive by the end of the season. Exactly. And the the big thing about, you know, Ajayi or people like to bring up um, the other aspects of that season, kind of try to discredit Tannehill is it's kind of confusing because you need those players. You can't just have one guy have an awesome game and everyone else just kind of be mediocre to win football because that's not how of it course. works. Um, one of the games I always go back to is when De- or, uh, against Denver when Tannehill went toe-to-toe with Peyton, but our defense couldn't, couldn't stop a nosebleed. But um, Absolutely. Like I mentioned, that 2016 had a lot of big plays, and um, it might be a little overreaction because it's the preseason, but isn't the four field goals a little you know, concerning with the, the same issues of flags? And they lack that big play. The one thing I guess I really want to see was you know, a quarter half of Tannehill, him at least aired out once. But um, is that concerning at all to you that they're just kind of playing this like small ball and haven't overcome the issues of the last couple of years? I think the biggest concern for me is the penalties and mm-hmm. the, the, pre, the pre-snap penalties, the holding, the pass interference. So, so I, you know, against the Panthers the other night, I, I thought that the call on AJ Derby was pretty ticky tacky. Yep. I thought the uh, I thought the you know defensively there was a pass interference call on Xavier Howard, which was a total non-call. Um, I am not overly bothered about what they do in preseason, frankly, because you know having spoken to people around the, the team, as I'm sure you guys have done for, for many years nobody cares about wins and losses in preseason. Right. They really don't. It's about, you know, formations, can the guys line up right? Can you know, how do we look? How's the tempo? How's the pace? You know, yep, that, that fast break offense, the no huddle looks pretty good. There's a few things they need to be to iron out. You know, Ryan had a had a, a, a pre snap penalty in terms of letting the clock run out, which is not ideal. Mm-hmm. But generally he looks mm-hmm. good. He moves around the pocket really well. He's getting the ball out quickly. He's making excellent you know, excellent throws. And listen it's game two of the preseason, and frankly, I, I, I don't care that they haven't really unleashed right. know, 60, 70 yard pass. I, I really don't. Look, Mike Jasicki has not been, I think he's been targeted twice. He wasn't thrown out once in, in the game last week, and there's a reason for that. Right. Why would, why, would you build, why would you build a season of you know, new plays and formations and all those sorts of things and then start throwing them out in the preseason? That to me is why would you give. The teams that you're about to play when it really matters, when the bullets are really firing, firing, why would you give them any kind of, you know, heads up about what what might be happening? You know, we've been in the red zone an awful lot, yet we haven't thrown to the one guy who is going to be the ultimate red zone target for us, which is, which is Jasicki. Why why is that not happening? The reason it's not happening is because what's the point? You know, you don't want to see Jasicki posting up or is he running corner routes or is it whatever? Because you're just going to show. Tennessee and Oakland and the Jets, the first three opponents, you're just going to show them exactly what we're going to do. You know, so then, you know, Jamal Adams will, will you know, will sit on Jasicki and they'll put, you know, or they'll corner up and, and put a safety over the top. Why, why would you do that? To me, it's kind of immaterial. Yes, you'd like to see touchdowns, of course. Yes, you know, you'd love to see Ryan do what um, Pat Mahomes did last week with, with, with Tyreek Hill. But really and truly, you know, I had a few people sending me um, the Tyreek Hill touchdown from the, from the, um, in the Chiefs preseason game last week against the, the Falcons, as if to say, you know, Kansas City can do it, so why can't Miami? Well, you know, the, the context is everything in that particular play. You know, the, the, the Chiefs were going against second and third team Falcons defenders. The routes that were being run on the outside meant the safeties were were held in position to allow Tyreek Hill to get down the. Do you know what I mean? There are just there are ways and means with which you have to take each circumstance as it comes. I just I think it's very easy and kind of a bit cheap to say, look, the Chiefs are able to throw down the field, but the Dolphins aren't able to. You've just got to take what teams give to you. And if teams are giving sure. up their need, as they were doing, then keep taking it, keep taking it, keep chucking in Kenyon Drake. You know, he's going to spin out of the tackle and run 38 yards. And then, and also, you know, look at the size of the receivers they've got. They have no Kenny Stills, there was no Devontae Parker, Jasicki was kept in the whole time. He's throwing to guys that, are, you know, Chicken Grant's five foot five. Right. Albert Wilson's, what, five foot ten? You know, you're not going to be throwing up back shoulder balls to, to five foot five receivers because that's just not, especially not in the preseason, because that's just not how it works. Right. You know, so I, I get that you'd like to see them throwing it down the field, but really and truly, if you're a Dolphins coach, you're not sitting in any of those meetings going, oh boys, we're in trouble here. We're not going to throw the ball down the field. That exactly. Will come in time. You know, 
Cam Cameron was 4-0 and in the preseason, and then the Dolphins went 1-15. and Let's just keep things in context a little bit. I think that's the, you know, and I get Dolphins fans' annoyance at right. how the last 20 or so years have been, but let's keep it in context. Yeah, and you make a really good point, and I guess I'm being greedy, but uh, when I was out the other night, you know, I'm just looking up and I see the Packers have, like, 38 points through, you know, mm-hmm. not even three quarters, and it just kills me where, you know, I think there was one play the Dolphins had, like, a sack fumble where um, they brought it back in for an end zone, but a penalty or a good play on offense, and, you know, we hear there's two flags on the play, and they're both yeah. on the offensive side, and it's kind of it just it just kind of kills me where it's, like, same old team. But you bring up an interesting point about how the offense, like the, the quick offense, looked really good without Stills and Parker. And are you a little concerned about Parker? Because it just seems like we're still waiting, 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 and – other guys are looking really good is it possibly just like a numbers game with him where maybe he's kind of just getting out of the offense a little bit i think you need him because mm-hmm. you need that presence you need the physicality that he brings and the height that he brings right my concern is that he's mentally not good enough to be an nfo receiver mm-hmm. and i say that in part because he seems to be waylaid by minor injuries that you'd expect players of his physical capability mm-hmm. to be able to play through Mm-hmm. And he's not ever shown the he's not ever shown the ability to play through pain, which is a concern. But I think what's more of a concern is that you know, and uh, you can't live your life vicariously through other people's social media. But what I do see quite a lot, especially on Instagram, is a lot of the players, especially the receiving core, notably Kenny Stills, who's kind of trying to take Devontae a bit under his wing as a team leader that Kenny paid him he is. Things like diet, things like sleep. Things right. like those are the sorts of things that it's clear Devontae has no understanding of in terms of how he should look after himself. You know, there was a there was a scene earlier, there was kind of an Instagram story earlier in the season where it was almost like they were out with Devontae, all the guys were eating kind of salads and quinoa and drinking water and that sort of stuff. And and Devontae's kind of there with burgers and Coke and stuff. And, and Stills is almost like shaking his head, I, I don't understand what part of this you don't get. Mm-hmm. And there was another there was another scene in the kind of the, the early spring where there were guys were all lining up at, at the Dolphin at, in Davie for their kind of lunch. And they were sort of taking that we would say over here, taking the mickey, you guys would say taking the, <laughs> I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but it's that kind of, you know, um, give, taking the rise out of Devontae because he again was eating unhealthily. And it's like, I, Kenny was like, I just don't understand why you don't you know you've got a diet plan there's a dietitian on the team who's telling you what to eat to help you become a better player and you're continuing to ignore it i just don't think he's a particularly intelligent person and Mm -hmm. we'd love to see him train on because he's got all the physical talent in the world absolutely there's been times where he's taken over games some of the catches you know that cat there was a catch and throw last um two seasons ago uh was it against baltimore maybe in the in the left end zone where, where he goes up over two defensive backs, Tannehill kind of throws it hard. It's a great throw, touchdown, and he kind of catches it at the goal line and sort of flips over two defenders. And you just you're in awe of that kind of thing. The yeah. one-handed catch against the one-handed catch against Oakland in the back end of the game last year again from 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 Cutler when the Dolphins are behind on Sunday night football. The one-hander over his, again. Very few people in the league make that catch, but why can he not do it consistently? And I wonder whether or not there's got to be a conversation. They've got to have had a conversation about whether or not you move Devontae. Right. You know, is there a, is there a team out there that you know a Baltimore or a Dallas or a, a, a team like that who you know perhaps not quite as strong in the receiving department as they'd like? You know, teams that are pushing for you know division titles potentially. Would a Devontae Parker help Dak Prescott? You know, would it help take pressure off Ezekiel Elliott? Um, you know, would it help a Joe Flacco or potentially a Lamar Jackson in Baltimore? You know, it, it's those kind of things that teams are going to be looking around now because they know that he's not quite doing it. And, you know, how many years have we heard coaches and Adam Gaze or Sean Jefferson last year or, or whoever say, you know, he's going to have a breakout year this year. He's going to, well, you know, we've been waiting four years for the breakout year and it's still not happened. So, and there's nothing that's happened this spring and summer that makes you think he's now primed and ready for that breakout. So it's a concern, I think. I think it's a concern. How much have you noticed anything different in the offense going from the you know from last year even two years ago? Like, have you noticed anything in the offense based off the two preseason games, or is it just kind of 
they're just very being they're just being very vanilla. No, I think they're. I mean, I think they're lining up in the personnel schemes that Gaze really, really wants to line up in. You know, and I think he now has the personnel to be able to do that. And I think you know those are the sort of you know he runs more Y ISO, so tight end in, in or three receivers to one side and tight end isolated in the other. He's got the tight end now that he can he can finally run that scheme and that system to to the degree that he wants to do it. You know, back to the days when. Manning was the quarterback in Denver, and he was the offensive coordinator, and it was Julius Thomas in that Pro Bowl year, and then you had Emmanuel Sanders, Demarius Thomas, and a another Brandon Stokely, whoever it was, on the other side of the field. That's the system that he wants to run. He wants to create mismatches, either by moving the tight end in motion, but getting a tight end up on a you know on a third string safety or a linebacker, and you know if he doesn't get the matchup that he wants in the tight end, then he knows that he's got the matchup on the other side. What he also has, and what I don't think we've seen particularly in the preseason, is out of the backfield. He has three monsters in terms of catching the ball. Mm -hmm. Frank Gore's an underrated receiver out of the backfield. But Kenyon Drake and Caleb Balage, I mean, I don't know if you've ever stood alongside Kenyon Drake, but you know, he measures in at about six foot two fifteen. If you stand if you stand next to him, he, he comes it, it feels like he's about six three, two forty. He's a <laughs> generally mm -hmm. he is a he is a big human being, especially mm -hmm. in the pads. But he's got great soft hands, you know, he comes out of that pro style offense in Alabama. You know, he caught the ball a lot in high school. Balage is very Balage has got really soft hands as well. You know, there are different. I think you'll see different personnel groups this year. Almost, uh, you could almost say on a down by down basis, but certainly on a drive by drive basis, where you can run. You know, let's say Amendola, Parker, and Stills with Jasicki on the other side. Then you can run two backs. Do you know what I mean? You can run a, a system with two backs, and you can flare both backs out of the backfield, go empty, and then you know try try a third corner or a fourth cornerback covering. Kenyon Drake out of the backfield. Exactly, that. yeah. Because that's, you know, look at what happened in that game against New England last year when, you know, they motioned Drake out onto the, to the perimeter and, you know, he takes a third safety for 60 yards down the field. I mean, he's, you know, I, I think there's some of the things that, that, that Gaze will look to do as well. But I just think they have been fairly vanilla in terms of the play calling in preseason. But as Gaze came out yesterday and as we talked about it, you know, five minutes ago, they're holding stuff back, and I and I totally, totally get that, and that's what I'd be doing as well. So, you know, I think there are certain aspects of, of vanilla, but I think ultimately it will bear fruit once the season. Look, look it, it, if it's week five and we're still throwing screens, you know, three-yard screens on third and 13, then I think we have a right to scream and holler, but I don't necessarily think that's going to be how it plays out. That's fair. And um, you mentioned Frank Gore, and he's finally going to play. There's a lot of hype around him. It's He's like the ageless wonder. I mean... Mm. They had Arian Foster a couple years ago, and you know some people were like, "Sure, it's the same thing," but uh, Gore has been making noise all preseason, or excuse me, all training camp. Uh, everyone's saying he looks quick; he doesn't age. Um, who are a couple players you're looking forward to seeing in the third preseason game, such as you know the real like uh, dress rehearsal of the regular season? Yeah, I mean, uh, Gore is certainly one of them, but I kind of don't, you know, if I didn't see Frank Gore until week one. It, wouldn't be, a, you know, wouldn't be an issue, like you say. Right. I think the difference between him and Arian Foster is slightly different. I think Arian's injuries have caught up with him a little bit, and I think there was a, you know, there was a. Arian had a lot going on, you know, his kind of whole conflict around his own personal religion and things. I think was weighing heavily on his mind. Mm -hmm. I just don't think he was the player that, you know, that he was, two three years before. Whereas I think Frank has kept himself in amazing shape. You know, he had nine hundred and sixty seven yards rushing last season. Uh, the players that I'm interested in seeing, uh, I think, are, are defensive players. You know, I need, for me, I need to see, I need to see a bit more solidity on that defensive line, especially the interior. Who's going to stand up and say, you know, I'm the number one guy? Jordan Phillips didn't play last week. You know, this is Phillips. He's in a contract year, so you're hoping for, you know, somebody's got to take over that defensive line because that would be a concern for me. Then it's the linebackers, obviously. There was lots to there was lots to like last week about Red Combo, but there was also lots to make you concerned in terms of just some of the, the, the things that happened. Um, notably on the Ian Thomas touchdown, um, but the first play of the game, or the first touchdown, the McCaffrey touchdown, in terms of those run fits, we've got to get those run fits right. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that certainly wasn't happening. But I think, you know, so I think that those two linebackers, and, uh, McMillan and Baker specifically, because they work so well together at Ohio State, you know, when they're alongside each other, and I think by mid-season, you'll see the two of them starting together. Because I think what you'll see is those two starting, 
and then you'll you'll see a prol- proliferation of the three safety look with with Fitzpatrick, who will just be too good to keep off the field. TJ McDonald and, and Rashad, and whether or not that means Lincoln plays in the nickel and Bobby McCain plays out on the perimeter, who, who knows? Uh, 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 other, you know, Fitzpatrick obviously looks to see, but I think there's a couple of those kind of young defensive backs, Jalen Davis specifically, who was a free agent pickup who we've been trumpeting all sort of through the through camp and even in the spring. I think Davis has got a, a real shot at making the 53. Um, so I'm interested to see to see him. Um, you want to continue to see the progression of a guy like Charles Harris, who's kind of gone under the radar. Cam Waits and the best training camp of any of the Dolphins, which I kind of feel like is a bit of a stretch, given that they've been out of, to all intents and purposes, looking you know like a, a premier boundary corner. But I think Harris has, has had a very very good summer, uh, and you want to see him pick up from the one sack and the forced fumble and the pressures that he had last week. You want to see him kind of take that on. So they're the kind of guys that I'm looking at. But there are some really interesting roster. You take the tight end position, for example. You know, Jasicki is the is the home run guy, and you know he's going to make the roster. But actually, you know, Marquise Gray and Tannehill have had a really good relationship in the past. The, the coaches, all they ever talked about back in the last season was AJ Derby and how high they were on getting Derby on the field. Mm-hmm. Gavin Escobar has generally played well. You know, he's he's never been mistaken for Travis Kelsey, but he blocks pretty well. He can get out and run some routes. Interestingly, with him, is that he plays space starts and he's been starting on the special teams units, and that's a decent indicator of whether or not a guy's going to make the, the team. And right. Then, and Darren Smythe, you know, are they going to get rid of a fourth round pick? I, I don't believe so. He's not, you know, I don't. Again, he's not going to mistake, you know, mistake Tyreek Hill in terms of speed. What he does is find those dead areas in the zone, and he understands blocking. He understands leverage. He understands how to set an edge. He understands the angles, the really key things. That he, and it's not easy for a rookie to come into the NFL and do that. Uh, and to all intents and purposes, he's done that very well through the, through the summer. So that's a really interesting battle to see how that plays out. And you've still got a guy like Thomas Duarte, who's been on the practice squad for a couple of years. So that's a really interesting position to, to see. So they're the kind of battles I'm looking for tomorrow. It should be interesting. And, you know, you want to see Ryan play a half and look good and let's get some touchdowns on the board and, uh, rather than, you know, sure. back to Tony Sperano and kicking field goals. <laughs> Yeah, how much is is these last two uh, games? Like basically, you have the game against the Panthers and the upcoming game against the Ravens. Uh, is this probably going to be our best premature like sample size of what we expect from this team, given the two teams' playing style? Yeah, I think so. I think so. But again, I, I, like like you know, how much are we really going to see of what this team will be? Well, I think you'll see the fast break offense. I, I think you'll see those eleven personnel groupings that Gaze likes to run. Um, I think you'll see the the, you know, the wire. So you'd like to see them get the ball down the field a little bit to to Jasicki. Um But uh, you know they're not going to game plan massively. You know it's not like we're going to spend all week looking at Ravens film and, and draw up a massive game plan for this game. You know so uh, it, I think the result of what happens on uh, this week I think will be taken with a pinch of salt because. Like we talked about earlier on, I don't think they actually care about the result. That's not the important thing. I think the important thing is making sure that people are lined up in the right place, that the, the fast break offense works well, that the run fits work well on defense, that Bobby McCain continues that progression into being a, you know, a, a solid number two corner. It's those sorts of things I think that they're looking for. Ultimately, the result really is immaterial. It's making sure that you come through healthy. It's making sure that the guys are now on the same page, that everything they've worked through training camp and through the spring is now fine. You know, because everything really and truly at this point, this game is important in inverted commas. But really, we're looking now two weeks ahead to the three weeks ahead to the start of the season. So that's really where we're going. That's the most important thing. Exactly, it's those fine details that um absolutely we haven't just really seen out. them work out yet. Exactly, but, just iron out some of the issues. But exactly, if one you know, if I can get two drives where maybe they only score ten points, but there's no flags, I'm gonna be like the happiest yeah. guy. That's that's all I really ask for. But um, you have been giving us such great, like, really detailed uh, information here. So I'm going to ask you, we're going to finish here with a super loaded question that doesn't involve a lot of detail. <laughs> uh, and it, Because in, in today's society, it's all gotcha and I told you so. So we're going to yeah. save this. What's your, um, are the Dolphins making the playoffs in 2018? So is, uh, 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 yes, this is, are you just going to play this back to me when they... Exactly. <laughs> when they no, fine. At least I know what the parameters are in terms of how much of a douchebag I'm going to look at the end of it. Do they make the playoffs? I think, they, I think they've got a good chance to make the playoffs. I really do. Mm-hmm. I, I, I would not be surprised to see them make the playoffs. I, I think if they can get rolling, they can get the offense rolling, they can sort out a few of those problems on defense. I think the talent is more than good enough. And I think they've got a number of 
good young stars that perhaps the rest of the NFL aren't particularly. You know, you're, you're expecting a lot. You're expecting five or six players to have to click in premium positions. Right. The quarterback has to be healthy. The running back has to be healthy. The left tackle has to play well. You have to get value from a defensive end. One of those defensive tackles has to play well. McMillan has to play well. Howard has to continue his performances from last year. Fitzpatrick has to step up. But I think the talent is there for them to make a play. Exactly. And that's the thing, you know, our, our name of the podcast is kind of a joke, like for in the hunt. But the Dolphins are always right there because, you know, the the room for error is so small where, you know, you need a Raquan McMillan to, you know, maybe pick off a screen or do something like that. You need, you know, the not the flags in the red zone. And I think you're right. They really have that really good shot of getting there. But the sample size between a 6 and 10 team and 10 and 6 team, you're going to see a lot of the same things. And we're going to need those guys to step up. But um, I think one of the concerns for me would be as well is that, you know, there are a lot of close games and we often play a lot of close games anyway. It's not like we blow teams out and win by thirty five mm-hmm. points. Right. How how big uh, a loss will be um the kicker from last year, the Duke of the Juggernaut leaving for the Bears. You know <laughs> Exactly. Uh, I, I feel the same it, way. That's a that's a critical you know, that's a critical thing. A field goal kicker that you can bring on with three or four seconds to go, lining up to take a fifty three yarder to win a game, you felt very, very confident that he was gonna do it. Uh, you know whether or not Jason Sanders has got that because I think Sanders will ultimately win the job. You know, and he's looked decent. He's looked good. He's got a big, powerful leg. But you know, when the chips are down, and you know, let's say we're in Foxborough and it's seventeen all, and you know, Ryan drives us down the field, and you're lining up to you know with a fifty-four yarder to win it. You know, in the you know in the big in the Buffalo season, Snow so. week week yeah, fifteen. In the Buffalo Snow. Exactly. It's gonna you know it's gonna put you in first place in the driving seat in the AFC. Can exactly. You, is he going to do that? Whereas you, you pretty much were guaranteed, and we've generally been pretty much guaranteed. You look back to the, the days of Pete Stoyanovic and the days of Linda Marlowe. Pete and, Stoyanovich. Uh, you know, those kind of guys. <laughs> you know, we've always generally been okay in the kicking game. Exactly. But, you know, is one of these rookie kickers going to come through in the clutch when you really need them in the snow or in the wind or in the rain in, in one of these critical games? And, Andrew Franks that, did it. Andrew Franks did it. He absolutely did it in Buffalo. So we shall see. We shall exactly. See that to me will be critical. We want more Cody Parkies, less Caleb Sturges. But absolutely, Simon, thank you so much for talking with us. You know, we love talking football, and you're proud. You're you're easily what the one of the smartest guys we've had on, and you just are uh-huh. spewing knowledge over the place. You, you, thank you, you so can't. much. Uh, five I've reasons network, three yards no. per carry. We'd we'd love to have you back at some point. My pleasure, boys. Anytime. Really enjoyed it. Awesome. Thanks, man. Have thank a good you so night. much, man. Oh, no worries, guys. Anytime. You know where I am. Just uh, just hook me up. I'm always happy to do it. Thank you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Take care. Take care, boys. See you soon. Man, Topher, I don't know about you, but that was a lot of fun. And Simon's a guy you can't argue with because he just has every angle of every point covered because he knows exactly what he's talking about. And if you want to hear more great interviews like this and uh, more Dolphins content, Topher, where would you where would you be able to find that? You can find us iTunes. You just simply type it in the hunt on iTunes podcast. Uh, Jake, we have a new Twitter handle that I actually have to get used to. Can you tell me what that Twitter handle is? It is at MIA in the hunt, Miami in the hunt. On there, we're going to have tweets by Tolfer and I, but also my buddy Zach Kalora, longtime Vikings fan, is coming on to give us a little bit of a film breakdown where he's not a Dolphins fan. So while we see, you know, the same guys, the same team every week, which there's nothing wrong with, it's going to be cool where we're going to be able to, you know, incorporate a fresh perspective on, you know, our favorite team to see where maybe there's less homerism, whether it's, you know, for the better or the worse. Uh, And then we're going to have House, our first employee, talking, you know, a little Madden. Maybe we'll try to do a couple giveaways on there, maybe set up some Madden tournaments. Topher, what's your Twitter handle, though? You can find me at Cochran108. And I know Jake's, I, I know you haven't changed it just like me. So yours is J Mendel94. No, yeah, J Mendel94, correct. You got that. You must have that tattooed on yourself. That it's, on my for, it's on my forehead. So I'm looking at myself in the mirror right now and I'm looking at it backwards. So that's why I kind of got it all mixed up. It's understandable. But Topher, next time we talk, we will be one week from the regular season. Fins up. Fins up. <laughs>